This is Patterton, Newton Mayor in Scotland, in 2019. A quiet residential suburb on the outskirts of Glasgow, with various housing estates, a train station and lots of green space. A nice place for children to grow up and for families to be comfortable and happy, with a lovely community spirit. However, it didn't always look like this. During World War II, only 80 years ago, this area was a prisoner of war camp. The camp held prisoners from Italy and Germany behind its gates. As we move along Stewarton Road, you can get a sense of the area's size. This is a small part of the camp from 1946, where you can see the camp's huts and what is believed to be a marching square. Patterton POW camp was unusually large. To the left of the road was the holding place of the prisoners. When we think of prisoner of war camps, we might think of intimidating guards, cold, uncomfortable, dirty accommodation, and prisoners who spend the days plotting escapes and tunnelling throughout the night. However, the Patterton prisoner of war camp has its own story. The camp housed two working companies of Italian soldiers for a year, from 1944 to 1945. These soldiers worked in nearby depots and stores and even partook in football games against local team Nitzhill Victoria. They were eventually given the freedom to move unsupervised amongst the local community due to being classified as co-belligerents. In this film, we'll explore what the camp was really like, both for prisoners and the local community who lived and worked in the area. How did the Patterton locals feel about the camp? What interactions did they have with their captured neighbours? What was it like to live beside the camp? What were the prisoners of war really like? Let's see if we can understand what the community relationship was really like and see what stories we can find along the way. Patterton, 1940s. The population is increasing as the camp is filling up with prisoners of war. An interesting time for the locals of Patterton and the surrounding area. What was it like? How did it affect the community? Let's hear from some of those who have memories of this time or have family who had memories. Let's start with Alistair's story. Alistair Mutri, whose dad was the timekeeper in the Patterton camp, was a young boy at only six years old when he first experienced the Patterton prisoner of war camp. With the timekeeper's office situated just inside the main gate, Alistair's dad's responsibilities were to make sure cards were stamped make sure people were on time and to clock the guards in and out when their shifts started and ended. Although Alistair was very young, he does have vivid memories of the prisoners of war and how they interacted with the locals. Let's hear from Alistair about his memories of the prisoners themselves. Can you tell us a little bit? Ah, yeah. As I said, I'm on, <clears throat> when I moved here, you know, the, the, the people that were in Canwood, you know, you, the women used to talk, you know, and you would hear them talking about getting mats down from the camp, right down into Thorny Bank. Now, whether they entered the main gate, I'm not sure about that, because the people in Canwood, Canwood Road and that, they used to hand toys to the kids, the prisoners. So I'd imagine there was a gate and somewhere along Can Wardrick Road. That's away at the other side. And I'd imagine they would end it because you know, they were giving toys to the kids. So I don't think they went through the main gate. They went right down Thorny Bank and down uh, Can Wardrick Road and entered in there. But I'm not sure about that. But I think that would be the only way they could hand the toys out to the kids. Yeah. Do you know anything about the toys? Oh, it was just, wood, just wooden, 
you know, just wood toys, you know, card. But it was a good relationship. I mean, I never heard one person, no, women or men, seen anything bad about these prisoners. It was always, you know, the, 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 there was a sort of an, a, an affection, you know, because of these handout to the children, you know. There just seemed to be, you know, I don't think there was any sort of cat calling or animosity or anything like that. I never gathered that. I always got that impression listening to the older people that there was a, a sort of an affection that no one felt sorry for, you know. I'm, I suppose they didn't know they were glad they were in a prison of war camp rather than fighting, but yeah, yeah, yeah I would say that there was. No, sir. I, I, I never heard them speaking ill of any of them. You know, it was always sort of positive stuff, you know. Handing toys, I know this is it, the handing the toys to the kids, getting marched down. Yeah, so. Wow, so from Alistair's memories, he can't remember anything negative being said about the prisoners of war, and that their relationship with the locals seemed fairly friendly. And he mentions about the toys being made. Have a look at this. This is the type of figurine that was made by the prisoners. So the prisoners of war seemed to get on well with the locals when they were out marching to work, but did they ever manage to develop close relationships with the community? Well, it appears that they did. Let's hear an extraordinary story from Julie Robertson regarding her aunt. Julie's aunt, who was 18 at the time, developed an intimate relationship with a German prisoner of war. Let's hear from Julie. My connection is my aunt was engaged to one of the German prisoners of war who was um, based, I think, in the camp. But initially she was born in Glasgow in uh, Aldburn Road in Pollock Shaws and she studied German at school. She was always fond of all things German. And I think my grandfather basically was quite interested in introducing her to some of the Germans because of the language thing, because she studied German at Schollen's Academy. My aunt was very vivacious, attractive woman who is very talented. And uh, I've got a newspaper clipping there about her latterly when uh, she tried, they tried to shut down the school that she was a teacher at in Argyllshire and the BBC made a little film about her. So it should be in the BBC archives. I might even have a copy and she refers to her romance with the German prisoner of war in it as the love of her life, which maybe a bit of an exaggeration but anyway it's on film so uh, throughout her life she continued her um, contact with the Germans that she met through her initial relationship with this uh, German man. Do you know roughly what age um, your aunt was when she first met her? Yes her uh, she must have been about 18. And do you have any um, stories of, of where they went or, or what they did in that first little period of, of meeting uh, each other? All I know is because of these photographs and I, my grandmother used to talk about it is they used to have them over for Sunday afternoon tea and the guys, the prisoners of war would bring musical instruments and they would basically do little kind of gigs in the back garden of Aldburn Road. It was 10 Aldburn Road, it was on the corner and uh, my aunt was also very musical too. So the prisoner was came here or, or um, to your aunt's house. Do you have any idea of how that made people feel or, or the attitude that they experienced of the local community? No, but I have to say that my parents, uh, not my parents, my, my grandparents and my aunt and my father were all taken on with it and it was a very, very, um, they were really very welcoming and hospitable and it all seemed very jolly to be honest. 
um, basically the relationship I've got photographs of him in 1952 but there aren't so many so I kind of get them she did speak about it and she said that she kept in touch with him and there's photographs as evidence that she went over to Germany and she met his family she remained a close friend of his sisters until she kind of died but the relationship with him I think maybe lasted a couple of years you mentioned about um, a portrait that was painted of your aunt. Aye. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, about that, if you know about it? It's a beautiful little um, oil painting that's maybe about, it's maybe six by eight inches and um, it's executed in quite a sort of Germanic style. It's quite funny actually because it looks quite Aryan. When you look at German painting from that period, you know, everybody looks kind of very noble and, you know, kind of Aryan, sort of the master race. So my aunt's got a bit of the master race about her in the picture. <laughs> Incredible. What an interesting and surprising story. And this really paints a new picture of how the prisoners of war and the locals around Patterton got on. Friendships and romantic relationships blossomed some of which lasted for a lifetime across Scotland and Germany. This gives real insight into the relationship between the local community and the camp. Well, we've heard about prisoners of war giving out toys and figurines to the locals and about some of the incredible relationships that developed. But what about the people who made a living beside the camp. Jessie Jolliffe tells us stories that she heard from her family who owned and worked on the Patterton farm. This is the area where the farm used to be. It sits in between Patterton Roundabout and the new M77 motorway. These buildings overlooked the camp. It was Jessie's grandparents who owned the farm and her dad and two aunts who were young spent a lot of time around there and the surrounding area. Let's hear some of the experiences of Jessie's family. The two sisters, aunt, one was older than the other, and if they went anywhere, I know Patterton was quite different from what it is now. It was very, very dark. There was no lights or anything. And what used to happen was that Grandpa would leave the farm and start walking down the road with like a tilly lamp and uh, the two girls would be walking up from Spears Bridge or Thornley Bank, wherever they'd been. It might have been at church or somewhere like that. It wasn't anywhere, you know, that they shouldn't have been. And uh, sometimes if they felt, you know, there might be someone about that they didn't like the look of, they would quite often knock the door in the guardhouse of the camp. And I think Grandpa had sort of vocated it with them that if there was anything untoward, they could go in there. Um, so Grandpa used to walk down with the, with the, the uh, light to meet them as well. Aunt Jessie from the other one, she always had a, a hat pin stuck in her lapel. Does it sound? <laughs> I suppose it was, it must have been quite a frightening time, you know, and then all the different sort of people from different countries as well, so you would be quite, you know, so she kept up with her. I don't know if she ever ever used it. Um, but she always liked to tell me the story about this hat pin and where I could find it if I needed it. <laughs> so, there you have it. Although there was an element of potential danger in the back of the family's mind when the children were out walking, there was never any need to use the lapel pin to defend themselves. In fact, Jessie goes on to state later in her interview that their family never experienced any threat or danger from anyone related to the Patterton prisoner of war camp. Well, we've heard about prisoners of war giving out toys and figurines to the locals and about the experiences of those who lived close by but what about the children who lived locally? Let's hear from a couple of those who spent time near the camp when they were children and about their experiences with meeting the prisoners. 
Firstly, Matthew McKinnon tells us about his memories of growing up in the area. We used to take the bus to Newton Mearns bus depot, which is where the Asda supermarket is now. Then we would walk down the hill where there was a field and a farm and a river, paddle on the river, have a picnic, and then we would walk down the Stewarton Road and past the camp. So we did that on numerous occasions. And the prisoners would come to the wire as we came down and we would always stop and chat with them. Uh, they were always attracted by the large number of young people because they thought my father and mother had all these children. They did have six, but that was, there was probably at least a dozen of us there. So on occasions, my father would have to bring the six of us together and say, this is my six and these are friends, I sort of think. Yeah, so that was really our connection with the camp. Again, more evidence of a friendly experience between the prisoners of war and the local community. But how about this for a story about children living near the camp? This must have been an experience for Alan Flower, who tells us about when he, as a child, accidentally ended up inside the Patterton prisoner of war camp. I also remember this is a story that I told over the years. I was out with my eldest brother on this so-called bogey, which consisted of a tricycle with a plank at the back. And we pushed this up to the top of the Patterton Hill near Hutchison's, which, which is a, or was rather, a confectionist and news agents. And at that location, there was a sentry box and a guard watching everything that was going on. And my brother and I set off down the hill, being pushed initially by the guard. And as we went down, we careered off the road, hit the fence and the back plank whipped up and I was thrown right over into the camp. Now, I can't remember how high this fence was, but I always remember that the actual camp itself, it wasn't what you would call high security. Anyway, I landed in the camp and then I was approached by, I think they were Italians who had been pottering about in the garden and they took me down to the medical centre where I was patched up because I had various cuts and, cuts and bruises. And then they gave me chocolate <laughs> and, then they, and then they took me down to the guard house which was the bottom end of the camp and my brother picked me up at that point, and we headed home. Wow. Can you imagine how that must have felt for Alan as a young boy? But again, as all the previous stories we've heard here demonstrate, there appeared to be a community-spirited and friendly attitude between the locals and the prisoners of war. Well, that concludes our look into Patterton Prisoner of War Camp. We've heard stories from people who had a connection to the camp. We've heard about how the prisoners used to interact with the locals when they were marching to work. We've heard of romantic relationships and the relationships of those who worked in the area. We've also heard some interesting stories from those who grew up as young children beside the camp. And these stories all had one thing in common. They all show that the relationship between the prisoners of war and the local community was generally very good. 